on Breaking Brown family. Let me get this echo out the way. Um, thank you as always for joining me for another wonderful show where we discuss black politics and we get our libations together and we get everything we need to have a conversation, your water, your orange juice, um, or whatever else you have that, you know, helps you out with the day or whatever you got to do. Do that. Get your libations together. We're going to have a conversation. Um, in the comments, though, I really want to know something. Do you all like a longer show or a shorter show? Because I'm going to make tonight's show a little bit shorter. I've had people say, oh, it's too long. Oh, it's too short. So I'm going to make it a little bit shorter. But I just want to get a, a consensus, if you will, in the comments of, like, the length of show that you want. And if you want to donate to the show, you can go to DonateBrown.com. You can go to Patreon.com slash YCarnell. Um, you can do all of that good stuff. You can do all of that good stuff. I will put, if you want to get the newsletter, the newsletter, if you're new here, is, um, it's just, a, it's just links that I find, um, along the way, which I think are good in terms of black political education, and black political education is what we do here at BreakingBrown.com, in case you are new, because one of the things that I realized, um, and somebody had to actually point this out to me, is that a lot of the people are new you know started out here when i started it was like six thousand um subscribers and now we're we're over 40 and so if if you if you are a long time if you are a breaking brown vet please understand that part of what i'm doing here i know sometimes that i run back over a few key points that i may have mentioned before please understand that i do that for a specific reason i do that because not everybody was here from the beginning and there are learning gaps so if I go over a little remedial math from time, time and time again, please understand why I'm doing it. And I'm not doing it to annoy you. I'm not doing it to make your life difficult or any of that stuff. I'm doing it for a very specific reason. Um, also, please like, please hit the bell so that you get a notification uh, when, when, when I go live. Please hit the bell. Um, please share it on your page, on your groups, and be able to defend it. If you call me to your page and you have not used the points that we have discussed here, we're going to have some breaking brown remedial education. Okay? So, what I want to kind of point to as I have this discussion today, I want to kind of, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this, but and I said it a little bit last week, but I want to go a little bit deeper into it. You have to, we have to, we have this thing, and I even hear a lot of black people say it in terms of like, well, we have to make this a more perfect union in terms of the United States of America as if we have ever been, as if anybody ever tried to do that, right? So the key that I'm trying to point to here is that what we're dealing with is not like racism and the invention of race as some kind of aberration, right? This is something that was key in terms of mechanizing and normalizing black failure. It is necessary. We said that last week when we talked about Derrick Bell. We said we use what he said in terms of the permanence of racism to show you that this, it, this mechanization is not anything that just like, well, it just kind of happens and, and, and we moving forward. All these regressions that you see are intentional. And so what I look for when I have these discussions is where can I find something to really kind of bring this home? Like, how do I bring this home for people that this is an intentional failure? And it's not an intentional failure because they hate black bodies. You know, somebody said, oh, Yvette, it's in the comments. It's just about black. It's, 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 are you were dismissive of black bodies. Listen, I'm not saying that that's not a part of it. But I'm saying there's a central theme here that goes beyond and always went beyond just some kind of hatred of black bodies. It was about how do we amass as, 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 as capital holders, as white capital, how do we amass as much money as possible? And the best way to do that is to have slaves instead of workers to do your, to do your work and then to have slaves that you can somehow invent a race and you can use that to differentiate them from everybody else. This is very, very, very important. This is very important. So, I was on Antonio Moore's page and I saw an article. And I said, I got to talk about this article in terms of the normalization and mechanization of black failure. Now, this is the article. If you all want to take your time and pull it up, 
A house you can buy but never own. A house you can buy but never own. And I want you to think about that. I want you to consider that. And what we're going to talk about is not just because we're going to get to this. We're going to get to the whole part about integration and segregation. We'll get to that at the end. But I want you to think about a house you can buy. That's the whole point of buying a house. You can own it. You can have equity, all that stuff. But see, what, what, what happens to us, these groups, this group who is designated as black? What happens to the citizens of slaves? Because you can't keep saying it happens. Well, no, Yvette, he was shot because of his skin color, color because he's brown. This is just all people of color. No, 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 no. Silicon Valley is run by a lot of people of color. If you look at the, a lot of the CEOs and the CFOs and in Silicon Valley, they're brown people. A lot of them are Indian Americans. I'm not talking about Native Americans. I'm talking about Indian Americans. But they're brown people, but they're still not seen as in the same vein as African Americans. So you can't keep making this just about black skin or brown skin or brown bodies. No, 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 no. It's much more complicated than that. And so that's the first thing that we need to kind of hone in on. You know, if that was the case, if it was just about brown people, then, you know, you know, Google's, Google's head wouldn't be Google's head in terms of who leads that company. If you go all through, you see a lot of that. If, we, if, if it was just about brown people, you wouldn't see as many H-1B visas who come from India, right? So I have to be African American, descendant of slaves, and I. But but if you look at many, even if you look at many light skinned black people, we're we're lighter than the Indians, but we're considered like, but we're black, but there's something else. So how is this? You know, how is this possible? Well, one of the reasons where it's possible, and I'm not I'm not saying I agree with this, but we have accepted. Hear me. We have accepted our place in America as the perpetual bottom. And we do that because we're not willing to put anybody on the bottom below us. Everybody else is willing to put everybody on the bottom below them. They're fine with a caste system. And I'm not saying, I'm not, listen, I'm not dealing with your idealistic view of what America should look like. Idealistically, what I fight for in terms of being on the left or whatever, what I fight for is I don't want to see, I would, in a perfect world, and what I fight for, I don't want to see anybody on the bottom. I wouldn't. That's not the world I live in, though. And so I can't be concerned about this view if I'm on the bottom right now and nobody seems concerned about how I'm living. Nobody seems concerned about my survival. Nobody seems concerned about my tribe. So I have to take a different vantage point and say, well, how does my, how does my tribe survive? We don't survive by just being on the perpetually on the bottom and saying that's wrong for anybody to be on the bottom. Nobody has a problem with us being on the bottom. And please stop telling me, well, you know, there's some very good white people. I understand that. Ain't enough of them, though. If there was enough of them, we wouldn't be living how we're living. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing. We wouldn't have to be having these conversations over and over and over again. There's enough data right now for every, every, every white person who wants to understand, every, uh, any, any other kind of group that wants to understand. There's enough data out there for you to know. If you don't, want, if you don't know at this point, you just don't want to know, which means you're just happy it ain't you on the bottom. You're not fooling me. You're not fooling me. So we're looking at this, a house you can buy but never a home. And what we find is that this is a trap. This is another trap. What, 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 black, what native black descendants of slaves are living is basically like, it's kind of like a video game. It might as well be a Pac-Man game or something where little thing come chomping. And it's all these, but built into the game, it's all these ways you can fail. And the little failure things come out of every corner. Oh, it's a ghost. Oh, some shooting at me. Oh, it's it? And it's a given that at some point you're not going to be able to reach the level. And it depends on how much stuff they throw at you. But with us, they throw a whole lot of stuff out. And it's not just because of black bodies. They throw a whole lot of stuff out because there are a lot of feeders who feed on this failure. Those of you who have watched the show before, hear me talk about how different groups and communities feed on black failure. Right? And so what I want to do a little bit during this show is kind of draw that out. 
and show you all the different kind of disparate groups like this house you can you can buy but never own part of what you're seeing there is like the the the, the feeding and then the necessity these people don't want to lose the money that they get off of our failure so if you can't if you're not you gotta you gotta hold you gotta think about this if you're not gonna lose the money that you get off black failure that means you have to just keep repeating the failure that means it has to become mechanized it has to become normalized it has to become accepted within society that listen i i black people have to fail if that's what black people have to do and fail in order for me to be okay then that's what has to happen so we see that the video gaming or basically kind of like going to vegas or whatever the case may be where you know you can't win but people keep saying that you can win and in this case you see when you see this and and and, and this is nothing new those of you who watched the show before know that i talked about go get the book the color of law what they're talking about not just in this book but what we're talking about is really that success in america requires stability and they've made us perpetually unstable and they set up a bunch of different traps right it's not an aberration it's a plan to continually make us unstable within the country of our birth right that's what we're dealing with so you have to you have to look at failure you have to look at us and you have to look at how all this plays out right and you have to explore and what we're going to do tonight is explore some ways in which this failure is 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 mechanized and logistically arranged for lack of a better word now this is a contract for deed what these people got caught up in and how they got taken advantage of was a contract for deed now what that means is you go to get a house and they say we selling you a house or whatever the case may be and when you get there and when you sign the paperwork you realize that it's not a house in the sense that it's not your house so you living in a house but it's not your house that's interesting right i'm living in a house but it's not my house so how did that happen well they set you up with something that's been around for decades it's called a contract for deed that's what they set you up with now what that means is that they have it set up where it's a contract for deed you could lose that home at any moment if you just miss payments so you could fix your home up do the best you could with your home you miss a couple payments and they you they get your fixed up home and start over again and what you find is that a lot of these homes are dilapidated and they're in you know they're in our communities there's no shock there i mean look at this chart i'll bring it up a little bit bigger so everybody can see bring it up a little bit bigger for you and this is this is this is the cab county georgia it's where i am now look at these now harbor portfolio properties that's this community that's this i mean that's this investment company that does this little this little thing with these homes where they you know you contract for lease and we can take it back with a little or nothing and you got to fix it up and we have all these things you have to do to keep it and before people before i have the 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 um i don't know what to call them except to call them the all all people matter brigade this is something that has been pra practiced religiously in in black communities and let me just read let me just read something from you from the color of law you know it says real estate firms sold their newly acquired properties at inflated prices to african americans expanding their residential boundaries because most black families could not qualify for mortgages that's the key because most black families could not qualify for mortgages i want you to put a pin on that and i'm coming back to it because most black families could not qualify for mortgages under fha and bank policies the agents often sold these homes on installment plans similar to those of, of charles vanderot developed in depot in which no equity accumulated from down from from down or monthly payments known as contract sales these agreements usually provided that ownership would transfer to purchasers after 15 or 20 years but if a single monthly payment was late but if a single monthly payment was late 
the speculator could evict the would-be owner who had accumulated no equity. The inflated sale prices made it all the more likely that payment would not be on time. Because they, they inflate these prices, right? Because what you going to do? You ain't got no credit. You can't get access to no mortgage. What you going to do? You going to barbecue or you going to meal do? Okay. Owner, owner speculators could then resell these homes to new contract buyers. Now, back then, those were owners, right? Right now, what you have is these investment companies. These are not even owners. Like the dude who, who, who you just saw the picture of, he never dealt specifically with a person. He only did this stuff online. Now, hold on. I want... Coming back to it. The full circle went like this. When a neighborhood had first integrated, property values increased because of African Americans' need to pay higher prices for homes than whites. Understand that we actually made home values increase other than what you've heard, okay? But then property values fell once speculators had panicked enough white homeowners into selling at deep discounts. Falling sale prices in neighborhoods where blockbusters, these are people who came in and made white people scared of black people, sell your homes, the Negroes are coming, the Negroes are home and sell everything you got over there, Negroes is coming. The Falling sale prices in neighborhoods where blockbusters created white panic also deemed as proof by the FHA that property values would decline if African Americans moved in. But if the agency had not adopted a discriminatory and unconstitutional racial policy, African Americans would have been able, like whites, to locate throughout metropolitan areas rather than attempting to establish presence in only a few blockbuster communities. And speculators would not have been able to prey on white fears that their neighborhoods would soon turn from all white to all black. So what do you have? And this is black life. This is how the slums were built. Pay attention to this. Because even if you go if you go look, if you go look at Adolf, Dr. Adolph Reed's class notes, there's a book that Dr. Adolph Reed wrote called Class Notes. Go look at that book. There's a point that he talks to there's a point where he there's a whole chapter on Farrakhan. And he quotes Farrakhan at one point of telling a white conservative news outlet. And you can't find it online right now because it was in like the 90s that well. You don't want to live next to black people because they don't clean up their yard. But you would want to live next to me because I take care of my house and I take care of my yard. When you do that, what you're doing is you're talking about the outcome. What do you mean if you're talking about the outcome? Everybody can clean up their house and fix their house up, right? Hold on. The FHA's redlining necessitated, necessitated, the contract sales system for black homeowners unable to obtain conventional mortgages, and this created con the conditions for neighborhood deterioration. So what happened was you had all these black people who were paying high prices, and this is how the slums were built. So listen, because black contract buyers knew how easily they could lose their homes, they struggled to make their inflated monthly payments. Husbands and wives both worked double shifts. They neglected basic maintenance. They subdivided their apartments, crammed in extra tenants, and when possible, charged their tenants healthy rents. Basically taking advantage of other black people to try to, to, to try to make the rent. White people observed that their new black neighbors overcrowded and neglected their properties. <gasps> Overcrowded neighborhoods meant overcrowded schools. In Chicago, officials responded by double shifting the students, half attending in the morning, half in the afternoon. Children were deprived of full day of scheduling and left to fend for themselves in the after school hours. These conditions, these conditions helped fuel the rise of gangs, which in turn terrorized shop owners and residents alike. I mean, you get the drift. Right. You get you. You sort of see what happened. It wasn't a case when you talk about what we did. It wasn't a case that we just didn't want to take care of our houses and we just like living in dilapidated homes. It was set up that way. It was set up that way. And that's what happens when predatory lending is the only lending that you have access to. If predatory lending is the only lending that you have access to, you set it up this way. 
The system mechanizes our failure. And then because we're failing and we're stacking people in homes and our homes aren't built right because they give us, even now when they do this stuff that we just, when they do this stuff right now and put us in this contract for lease BS, when they do that, they give us these shabby houses that we have to fix up. So you have to keep your house up, but really you're renting. That's the con. You don't own a house. You're never going to own this house because something's going to happen most of the time that's going to prevent you from ever owning this home. But they need somebody to fix up this home. Now, you may ask me, Yvette, well, where did all these houses come from? Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, you remember the whole, you remember the whole collapse of the economy, am I right? You remember the housing bubble that burst, am I right? You remember these AAA rated you know, these, these, these subprime mortgages, which were labeled as AAA rate derivatives so that people on Wall Street could make money, right? That's another, another way. Take note. This is just another way that people are making money off of black failure. You remember all that, right? So if you remember all that, then you understand how this happened. So what happened was the Obama administration, instead of what they should have done is renegotiate the loans, HAMP was basically a failure. So what they should have done is renegotiate the loans in such a way that people could keep their homes and not give banks control of this process in the way that they did. So people could keep their homes. FDR did it. It's not like it couldn't be done. So that these people could keep their homes. But what they did was sell them at low prices to investors after people have been foreclosed on. And so the investors are now looking at the best way to make their money back. Well, the problem is most of these homes are in black neighborhoods. And black neighborhoods don't accrue. They don't appreciate. Homes in black neighborhoods don't appreciate. So they have to find a way to do something to you to turn the screws to make as much money as they can make as quick as they can. Which means getting you to fix the house up and then taking the house back to you, back from you, and then giving the house and then selling the house to somebody else. This is how it all works. It's all a scam. It's all a mechanized scam so that a bunch of people can make money off of our failure. It's genius, but it's evil. And some people, you know, you have the do for self or so say, well, Yvette, we can just do the same thing. Doing the same things means you as a black person, native black person, descendant of slaves, taking advantage of your own tribe. That's what doing the same things mean. I was in conversation with a girl on Antonio, a uh, woman on Antonio Moore's page. She was like, well, I, I have grace. And I'm sure she considers herself a Christian. I have enough grace that I have extended people to mispayments. What? Wait, 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 hold on, wait, 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 wait. You've extended people two mispayments from this contract, and you don't understand from this contract deed stuff, and you don't even understand that what what our people need is access to good mortgages. What we need is access to stability. We don't need you doing the work of white capital so that you can get your money saying, Well, I have extended grace event to my people. That's what I've done. Because I let them miss two payments before I, before I started executing. Um, notice you didn't say three. Before I started executing, taking the property back. And so what I'm telling you is that part of what needs to happen is that we have to hold our own community. We ask about solutions. One of the solutions is if you are, and we are, we have a tribe that is based on lineage. We have to have certain standards. You can't have a tribe. You have to have inclusion. You have to have exclusion. And in terms of who we are, we have to have certain standards. You cannot take advantage of your own community. And that's what you're doing. If you're involved in reverse redlining, if you're involved in selling BS products to your community, if you are involved in any of this stuff that we're this contract leasing, you are a predator for the person who owns the company that you work for. You are a part of the problem. We can no longer, we can no longer, ladies and gentlemen, we can no longer allow these people to walk among us and say, well, you know, everybody got to get their paper. Everybody got to get paid. I, you know, I, if you're pushing people into, if you pu- we had black people going to black churches, pushing these subprime mortgages on black people, even if these people had the money or the credit score for regular mortgages, you were coming in our communities, in our churches and institutions, and pushing this on us. 
you are a part of the problem. You should be excommunicated from the community. Because our community cannot be based just on skin color or hair texture. We have to have certain standards as a people. That's a, and if we don't have that, that's a problem. We're going to continue to experience the ramifications of that. But understand something. Let me bring something else up. Because this is from a... Um, this is a different article. I, well, I, I don't think I want to go to that one that quick. But I just want to put up a quote from a study. So you all can see. It says, one study found that between 2004 and 2007, African Americans were 105% more likely than white buyers to have high cost mortgages for home purchases, even when controlling for credit scores and other risks. Listen, when you have more high cost mortgages and the study has control for credit scores, that means you're just taking, taking advantage of. Obama's administration could have, could have, did not, but could have filed suits, discriminatory suits against these banks. They could have audited these, audited these banks. All that could have happened, and it wouldn't have required a Republican Congress. And please don't tell me, well, you're just talking about Obama. I don't know why you won't move on. We, are, we haven't moved on from Lincoln. We haven't moved on from JFK. We haven't moved on from Nixon. We haven't moved on from any of these people. We don't move on. We always assess and reassess a president because the president is not a person. A president is a, 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 a group of policies. And we look at how those policies affect our group and our community. That's what a president is. You don't move on from a president. He's not your friend. He ain't never been your friend. Shout out to Robert Winston and, and, and your London Douglas. I appreciate the, 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 uh, the, chat, the, the donations in the chat. But listen. Listen. We have to understand something. We, had, we have people losing jobs. And we still have people. We, what you saw during that whole thing is that black people were, once again... When you talk about eating off our failure, we were targeted with subprime mortgages even when we had the money. So all this stuff about, well, if you just had good credit, it don't matter. That None of that mattered. Credit or not, we still got targeted. <laughs> and so when you ask me what that means, or, and, and look at, I want you to look at this. It's for people of color, banks are shutting the door to home ownership. And if you read that article... What you find is that they were shutting the door to people with good credit. They were shutting the door to black people with, with good jobs. There is no kind of whack-a-mole strategy here where you just say, well, if you just get your credit together, where if you just say money, these people had money, they had down payments, and they still couldn't find a house. And so when I talk about government, I'm never saying that government is the be-all and end-all of everything. I'm never saying that. But what I'm saying is that you need it because understand this. Government is never indifferent. The most powerful, this huge government in the richest country in the world that moves nation, that destroys nations, is never indifferent. It is always going to choose winners and losers. The question is, how are you going to leverage the government to act on your behalf? There is no space for an Afri a native African, I don't say, a native black DOS person to opt out. That's not even a choice. You can't do it. It's not a choice of, well, what, am I going to do politics now? You don't have a choice. You got to do it. I'm not saying you can't do other stuff too. I'm not saying you can't go and try to start a business, do whatever. But this has to happen. It's kind of like your heart has to pump. It doesn't mean that you, it, your heart pumping doesn't mean that your lungs don't have to work too. But your heart has to pump. Right? It has to. And it, you have to be a part of the body that gets good blood. Oxygen rich blood. If you don't, then you have a problem. Then your feet swole and jacked up and all kinds of stuff that we see like in the elderly people. We got like elderly feet and we like, we like young. Like you have to, it has to work. Government has to work. And the thing is, we, 
we aren't necessarily interested anymore. We feel like we can do stuff without government. Like we superheroes. Nobody else feels that way. And like I said, it's like, you know, good credit. Well, you just should have good credit. Good credit is about stability. People who have good credit have stability. They've had a job for a long time that's consistently paid them or they didn't have a problem getting a new job. Right? They really don't face much in the way of discrimination. That's what good credit is about. When you see somebody has good credit, that means they have had a, they have had a period of stability in their lives. Probably about at least 20 to 30 years minimum. When's the last time you had 20, 30 years of stability where you didn't have no upheavals in your life? But you're going to judge yourself if your credit ain't right. And understand, it only takes a couple of things for your credit to be right. Somebody can put you on your credit 30 days late, knocks you out the game. Then you have something else because probably you got more than one bill. Who has just one bill? So you got a car note, you got a credit card bill, you got rent. And let's say you laid on all that stuff because you got laid off. Drops your credit score down like an anchor. No stability means no good credit score. So we have to first of all understand that and stop judging ourselves without understanding that credit is an outcome of stability and we don't have stability. You have to understand that. You have to understand that when we deal with each other and how we judge each other. We have to, we have to get this together. Now let me just say something. I read The Color of Law. The book I just read a portion of because it's important. Because it shows that like the targeting of native black descendants of slaves is nothing new in terms of this is how people are making money. There are like the, the only way for me to put it is there are like predatory layers going on. There are layers of predators who are doing all kinds of stuff, right? Predatory layering. So the 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 whole contract deed is one it's just one thing okay well you think about it when you're trying to get good credit or you're trying to figure out your credit then the credit bureaus you have to pay the credit bureaus because credit bureaus should really be owned by the government but they're owned by private companies that make a bunch of money i'm sure the, the ceos of credit bureaus their kids are doing fine right then you have a bunch of people black people included who do all this credit fixing stuff why well, fix your credit i'll send the letters out for you I do all this stuff. So you have another layer. And then you have a layer in terms of you have people like the people who caused the, the, the recession, the Great Recession, who took advantage of, of the system and were just passing out home loans because they knew they could package them in a way that would make money for themselves. And they knew that if they could get enough black people into these BS home loans, that would be good for them. Okay, you got that going too. You, 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 you got that going too. Then you have payday loans. Well... Well, if you can't get, if you, if you in a bind because of all this stuff, you can go get you a pay loan to get you out of a bind, right? Another loan, another, another bind. Well, if your credit's bad, well, you can go and get, um, you go to rent a center or somewhere and you can have access to that. So there, are, what I'm, what I'm saying is there are all these layers of predatory credit that exist to take advantage of us. It's not a mistake or it's just, oh my God, we need a more perfect union. And I'm kind of tired of hearing black scholars and, 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 and black intellectuals and who, I mean, I have a great respect for a lot. I get a lot of my stuff on this show from black intellectuals, but I'm kind of tired of hearing black intellectuals speak about America as if like, well, we just, if we have to, we have to make it a more perfect union. We, it's, we still have some work to do. No, it ain't no work to do. This, this stuff was baked in. Like us being on the bottom, like you can't read all these books and not understand that we're, the, our failure is baked into this whole scam. In order for them people to live good, them people who have been designated as white, in order for them to live good, we have to live bad. We have to eat it. We have to eat all the failure. So you're going to live a good life, but you're going to throw all the failure in my community. And that's what has to happen. And, and you're going to make millions of dollars. Like, not only just throw the failure, there are all these little, like, from the, like I said, from the payday loans to rent a center, there are all these little industries that exist to make money off of us failing. That's part of why you don't see it go away. You saw the whole thing. First of all, if you're from Florida, can I ask you a question? Is he from Florida? Wait, let me let's come. Elsie Hastings, the con congressman from Congressional Black Caucus. Where is he from? Wherever he's from, I think it's Florida. Is it Florida? Y'all gotta get rid of him. Like, is he gone yet? Did I miss some stuff? He gotta go. Like, part of the problem is we don't pay enough attention to know when we got corrupt leaders. Right? 
you would get like LC Hastings is like one of the ones fighting for like stupid stuff. And we don't want to, we don't want to acknowledge or we don't even pay attention. Like I remember a while back, he was fighting Maxine Waters because he was doing the bidding of Wall Street. And he was just doing it kind of like, hey, I'm, I'm greasing my own pockets. And like that should have been outrageous to the black community. But instead you heard nothing. We didn't say anything. We didn't behave in any kind of way that was significant or would have sent a message to him is that, that this is unacceptable for you to be doing the for you to be doing the bidding of an industry that has that has targeted African Americans and has preyed on us that this is unacceptable. That not only should you be sent but should you be sent home. You should not be allowed. Like, there are some people who, if they come into your beauty salon or barber shop, you should just be like, nah, dog, you ain't getting no credit here. Yeah, Alcee Hastings is Florida's 20th district, uh, contains portions of Broward and Palm Beach counties. Yeah, why? Get rid of him. Like, he's awful. Why is he there? And why don't you get rid of him? Why can't you, why can't you, like, we have to be willing to replace these people and replace them quickly. Like, you, when you have to go, you have to go. You don't got to go. Like, you don't, I, I need to be able, and that means we have to build up. Uh, when you talk about solutions, we have to build up a group of people who are ready <coughs> to take over at a moment's notice. Okay, I need you to take this person out. You ready to run? We need to have people in Florida, people in people in Georgia, people in the people in people in people in Maryland, people in California, everywhere. You ready? You next on deck. He gotta go. We gotta stop having this affection with people just because well he's he's event well he's he's native black, he's a sinner of slave. Yeah, but he's also he's also really corrupt. That's a problem. So what you see is all of these groups that are making money off the fact off of our failure that's what you see and there was another article and i didn't even talk about the fees like if you go to the liquor store to cash your check because you unbanked and you became unbanked because they were remember the whole story from a while back how you become unbanked because they hold how they hold the money that comes in versus the money that you deposit and so you have all this money and, and, and overdraft fees right so then what you do, you got to go to the liquor store. Well, they're going to charge a fee too. Everybody's charging you fees. Think about building this country with free labor and everybody charging you fees on everything. So the, the, this, this man, in, you know, when you, he said, well, well, I thought I stumbled across a good deal. Understand one thing, black people. If you don't understand anything else I say, we don't ever stumble across a good deal. We stumble across con artists. Some of these con artists, con artists are black. Some of them are white, but we stumble across con artists. We never stumble across a good deal. So if it sounds too good to be true, then you in the presence of a con artist and they don't care. They don't care what happens to you. They don't care whether your family eat. They don't care whether you eat. They don't care. And let me just put this from the, the other article I put up about discrimination in housing because we have to talk about it. Like... The people who can't, who, whose credit is decent and can't get a house. And this is from, let me pull up this article again. You all saw this article I pulled up a second ago. This quote that I'm putting up now is from that article. And it says, the year-long analysis based on 31 million records relied on techniques used by lending academics, the Federal Reserve, and Department of Justice to identify disparities. It found a pattern of troubling denials for people of color across the country, including in major metropolitan areas such as Atlanta, Detroit, Philadelphia, St. Louis, San Antonio. Okay? African Americans faced the most resistance in southern cities, Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, Greenville, North Carolina, and Gainesville, Florida, and Latinos in Iowa, Iowa City, Iowa. People always tell you to go south, right? Well, you they got cheap houses in the south. I don't know when you're going to be able to get one. There is no solution. And, like, the thing is, like, in terms of, like, there is no solution that includes, like, running. Don't, didn't you learn anything from the Great Migration? And we're going to get into integration in a moment. We're going to get into that because we got to talk about it. 
And we got to talk about what happens. See, people are like, well, I don't understand. We got a lot of simpletons that we got to deal with. People be like, well, I don't understand. What's the problem with, like, contract lease? He still got a house. He don't get no equity in that house. Don't you understand that equity is the thing that you use? It's like it's like your car. Like if a kid needs money, when you pass that down to your kid, the kid has equity. If your kid needs money in college, maybe you pull some of the equity out of your house to help your kid. That's generational wealth. So when you give them a house with no equity, you're not giving them the ability to pass down wealth to their families. That's what happens to us. You have, like, when you have this, this contract lease stuff, what happens is that you have all the responsibilities of a homeowner, but you don't have a home. And you don't have any of the good things like equity come with a home. So you got to fix it up. You got to pay the taxes, the property taxes. You got to do all that. But you don't have a home. It's a scam. It's a white capital scam. And all these little people who are native black people and African Americans who are part of that scam should not, they should be excommunicated. I don't want to talk to you. You a little scam or you a little scavenger scammy person. Don't talk to me. Don't walk up to me at the airport. Don't walk up to me at the grocery store and try to explain to me why you did it. Because I'll just walk away from you. And ain't nothing you can do. What you want to do? You going to make me talk to you? No. You're a scam artist. You're just doing the work of white capital. Talking about, well, you know, it works for some people who can't get homes. The point is, why those people can't get homes? And what we have to do in terms of making demands of our government to, 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 to get those people in a position so they can have normal mortgages. We have a history of oppression in this country for our people, sustained all the way from slavery to 2018. I'm talking to you right now. You don't get to tell me that these people don't get to do what they need to do in terms of having a mortgage just because well, they had bad credit. You better leave me alone. What's wrong with you? No. They have bad credit because America. You know why you have stuff wrong? Because America ain't in terms of what we need it to be. And black people, native black people, who should be the main agitators in this country, are like, I don't need no government. I don't need... What? Everybody needs government. Everybody goes to Capitol Hill and advocates. But you're going to tell me you don't. The government, has been, the government has been poised to oppress us for hundreds of years. And you don't need them to correct what they did wrong? Okay. What's up, Nassau, Bahamas? I saw you. But you have to understand what equity means and the lack of equity, right? And you have to understand, you know, what it means to have a black person in your community, a descendant of slaves, saying, I'm just going to sell this redlining. I'm just going gonna, gonna, I'm gonna to try to get somebody in this house that's got, you know, it's, it's, it's got a real, real and interest rate, it's a, it's a subprime mortgage, I'm going to sell them, but I'm going to do it because I got to eat. No. You don't get to damage our community because you want to come up. And it's not just because you got to eat. Stop lying. You want to you wanna come up. You want to drive around and look real nice and look real good because you want to come up off of black people's failure. I, I'm just going to do like what white people do. White people do it all the time. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. No, if the game is rigged against my people, I hate the game. And you should hate the game too. The game, if the game is rigged against you, why wouldn't you hate the game? That's the stupidest thing for black people to say. Don't hate the hate the don't hate the game. Here, yeah, hate the play. Hate the game. Hate the game. What? I do hate the game. I hate the player too. I hate both of them. Because if the game is messed up, why wouldn't I hate the player? And if the player's messed up, and the game, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. This is a whole system. But let me get to the end so I can just. So I can just bring this all the way home. One of the things I want to say in terms of solutions, because a lot of people say, well, Yvette, what's the solution? I don't understand what the solution You know, the Cons Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I always hope that Elizabeth Warren would be able to lead that bureau. It didn't happen. She ran for Senate one. Great. But you have to understand that one of the things that we should have been pushing to protect and advocating for is that because it understand now if you file a lawsuit against a big company you don't know what that big company is going to do 
That big company could come after you for, for court fees if you lose or whatever, and you probably are. You probably don't have the money. You're not going everybody don't get legal aid. It depends. They're booked, right? It's a heavy caseload. So what I'm saying to you is when you go into the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there's a list like of, of, of stuff that's against the law. You can file a complaint with them, and that's something that we should have been advocating for all the way through. You have to know when you talk about solutions, you have to ask yourself the things that I should advocate for, and that's one of them. We don't have to worry about court costs. We don't have to worry about going into court alone. We can just provide. We don't even have to worry about what's illegal. They give us a line by line, like of, of this is this is this is against our uh, this is a, this is illegal or this is against our uh, uh, X Y Z regulation. We need that. So the question becomes, why weren't why aren't we more involved in saying we need these kinds of solutions and regulations? And that's one solution. I'll be like, if, a lot of people are always like, well, Yvette don't offer solutions. I do, but you just don't like them because you want your solution to have you in a Bentley, which is a gaudy, like, weird-looking car. But that's what you want because you've seen it on rap videos. And so since I don't offer that, you say I don't offer solutions. I offer a lot of solutions. You're just not prepared for them. And that's not my problem. So, you know, there's no fee. with the, when, you, when you do a government protection, there's no fee for you. There are a lot of beneficial things going through the government protecting you because that's their charge anyway but that's not what we want to do and the, the, the second point I want to point out even when we talk about evictions there was another lot of good articles as of late to the point to where nobody can say like well I didn't know you didn't know because you didn't pay attention and so let me pull this up real quick in 83 million eviction records a sweeping and intimate look at housing in America. Of course, who's on the bottom? A disproportionate number of who? Us. Not because of anything we've done, but just because of how life is for us. And you see how the system is rigged against us. So, you know, when you look at the writer of the article, the writer of the article, they even talk about how attorneys can bring their phones in. We can't, but, but people can't bring their phones in. And the judge will tell you, well, leave your phone in the car. A lot of these people ain't got cars. So a lot of people are burying their phones behind bushes. This is Richmond, Virginia. Now understand partly why this happened. Richmond, Virginia doesn't have a lot of tenant protections. Virginia in general. So, if you live in this community, you should be fighting for more protections for tenants. That's government. That's state government versus federal. That's still government. That's still your life. This is still an explanation, explication of how these policies affect you and the people you love. Right? And just, just I want you to look at this. Look at the ev eviction judgments for renting households. Just take a look at this for a second. 2016 judgment rates for renting households. And I want you to look at what I look at. Uh, let me pull this up a little bit so you can see this. One in 25, one in 50, one in 100. Look at that dark blue. Look at how that dark blue, dark blue spreads around and see where it spreads around at. And tell me, tell me if we're not targeted right and the median the median was like 600 a little over 600 dollars in terms of in terms of and filing for eviction and that number is underreported why because they only report the people who 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 like got evicted from court like if they went to your house and you had already left before the proceedings that don't count so it's really underreported People tell you to move to the south, though, right? And then what people say, well, you could just, the houses are cheaper and the rent is cheaper. Yeah, but it's, it's cheaper to get you out of there if you make a mistake. It's all kind of problems with the south. The states you're trying to run from are where evictions are lowest. Look at this light blue versus dark blue. People will go from the little light blue states 
or the little states that ain't got hardly any blue and say, I'm going to the south. I'm going to the south. I'm going to have a better time for myself. Well, wait a minute. Hold up. You running from a place with, like, not hardly any evictions to a place with a whole lot of evictions? What do you think is going to be the outcome there? Don't worry. I'll wait. Running, my friends, because... Failure for us is so entrenched in the system. Running, my friends, is not a solution. Going from state to state to state to state. The great, the great migration, we went from the south to like Detroit or Chicago. We, we were moving and moving and moving. And we can't keep moving. At a certain point, you got to stay and fight. And you're running because you can't afford to be American. You're not running. You're running because... Everywhere we go, people are pricing us out. And people are saying, oh my God, that's expensive. A lot of the stuff we think of as expensive ain't really expensive. It's just the fact that we've been priced out of America. I saw a commercial the other day. It was a commercial for Walmart. And the woman at the Walmart, and the woman at the Walmart commercial, she was just dropping pacifiers, and the baby was giving pacifiers to the dog, and the baby was throwing pac- throwing bottles out the window, and doing all kind of stuff I wouldn't let the baby do. And she was just every time the baby did something, and gave a pacifier to the dog, she just ordered a new one. Okay, the baby, do, okay, all right, do, okay, okay, I'll go, okay, all right. And I thought to myself, what, 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 what was it? You, you just bought all that stuff. You just bought a bunch of new stuff because the baby was throwing it away. You better put that pacifier in the dishwasher. But then I thought to myself, and I said, well, this is what it means to be American. You can just log on and buy some new stuff. You ain't got to do all this other stuff. You can just log on and buy a bunch of new stuff. That's what American is right now. We don't understand that because we're not American. We've been locked out of what it means to be American. And we don't even know it. And we've been told by our financial guru people that if we just try harder... We'll make it happen. And we don't even know that these people don't know what they're talking about. And look at this chart about Richmond. This chart, follow a year of evictions. And this is the end of the chart. But what you find is that these are, these are racialized evictions too because we're on the bottom. And most of these are default judgments because we don't show up to court because we know if we show up to court, ain't nothing going to happen. Like, we don't, know the, we don't know our way around the court. We don't know what to do. And even when we get there, we don't know how to navigate. Right? So this, this, this is a bigger problem. And here are, the, here are the cities with the highest evictions. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. North Charleston, South Carolina, Richmond, eviction. Look, 35%, 30%. Hampton, Virginia, Newport, Virginia. And that's because of the laws. That's because Virginia doesn't, you see, Virginia keeps showing up there because they have no protections. Very, or very lax protection for tenants. Jackson, Mississippi, well, that's no surprise. Norfolk, another Virginia. Greensboro, North Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina. Warren, Michigan, and Chesapeake, Virginia again. This is the consequence, ladies and gentlemen. This is the consequence of policy. Whether or not you have protection for tenants is a consequence of policy. I don't know how black people can tell me that policy don't matter. You see policy mattering from the state level to the national level. You see it right there. And North Charleston is 47% black. Understand that what they're talking about, think about North Charleston being 47% black and all those evictions. Think about what that means. Think about what that means. And it's not about, like, I, I, you know, when we had, you know, one of the things I want to end with. Well, we got a lot of notes. <laughs> far, far and below, I got a lot of notes. Um, but what I want to end with is that part of the solution, and when I talk about this, when I talk about the solution in terms of this, what part of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about when, the, when, the, when, when we talk about the Fair Housing Act and how it got passed, 
one of the things we talk about is that there was a sense of urgency because King had just been murdered, right? Martin Luther King. Um, and what we have to ask ourselves is how do we continue year after year to produce a sense of urgency to hold our government accountable? Because there has to be enforcement. We have all these anti-discrimination laws. But there has to be an enforcement of that. And you find, you know, Mitt Romney wasn't much of a politician. Or, and I didn't, I didn't like him. But, but God love him. His daddy actually worked for Nixon and tried to, like, deal with this discrimination problem. And Nixon was basically like, no. And I, he, Nixon said, I understand the consequence of not doing the work, and I don't care. I'm just not going to do it. Nixon did the, a lot. He said, I'm going to just make black people believe in black entrepreneurship. That's what Nixon said. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to give people fair housing. I'm going to fool black people with this idea of black entrepreneurship. I'm going to get me a few black entrepreneurs, and that's how I'm going to fool black people. And I think, I think we've been fooling black people with black entrepreneurship, thinking that black entrepreneurship can exist outside of black politics for a very long time. But I say that because there has to, we just can't have an urgency in terms of our politics when somebody we love is assassinated. This is something that has to happen day in and day out. And you ask me, well, is that, how is that possible? Well, listen, one of the things that you have to ask yourself, there is an enforcement. There is enforcement in every, you know, in every, in, in, in the Justice Department, when you look at housing, there are enforcement. There's an enforcement little wing or whatever. One of the questions that we should always ask is like, what is the budget for the anti-discrimination office in this department. Let me say it again. What is the budget for the anti-discrimination wing of this department, right? What is the budget? Trump is trying to zero out those budgets. And Ben Carson, he, I mean, he only has a brain to operate on brains. It don't work for nothing else. Like, he just walks around, well, I don't know. I guess I can. I don't know. I've always... That's just, he's, he's like that, that he's kind of like the brown skin character of like the dude from Atlanta, like that, that last episode. That's what it is. But we have to, we have to, early on, say what is the budget for this department? And if it's not right, if it's not right, we have to hold those people kind of like, no, 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 no. This cannot be. Trump is over there zeroing out budgets. And we ain't even, we're not even talking about it on the regular. We don't even, like, this is something that we should talk about. Did you know Trump is trying to zero out the budget? Did you, did you see what Trump did? He tried to zero out the anti-discrimination budget, and they done changed the language, too. Did you see that? Oh, my God, I saw it, and we got to get out of We have to create an urgency outside of assassinations. It's just necessary. And there has to be an enforcement. Listen. I'm going to just say it, and hopefully you understand it. But politics, or policy, not politics. Let me just say policy is people. What do you mean? I mean, you have to have people who are willing to enforce the policy. Having the policy there and not having people in place to enforce it is a problem and we should look for people who are very vehement in terms of how they are going to enforce the policies that benefit us the the the, the fair housing act is very clear in terms of the affirmative action that the how that, that it says should be taken to reverse discrimination but don't nobody do it so it don't matter you have to have people personnel is politics Personnel is policy. It is about the people you put in place. So we should be very interested of the people who are being put in place, the Justice Department, the Housing Department. We're talking about HUD. We're talking about commerce. We should be very interested in the personnel. As African Americans, native black people, descendants of slaves, we should be studying these people's backgrounds and talking about that one-on-one -on -one to ourselves. We have to get serious because it is about whether or not we live or die in this country is going to have a lot to do with our awareness 
and how we use that awareness. There's a lot to be distracted about. There's a lot of stupid stuff going on about Cardi B and all this stuff. I don't care. I got to focus on this right here. I'll leave Cardi B to the children. That's who should be listening to her music. If you're 45 and listen to Cardi B, I don't know what to tell you. But I need to focus right here. You understand? This is something that I need to focus on. I have to have a sense of urgency. I have to be aware. I have to be engaged. It's essential. And one of the things that I can't do, one of the things that I can't do, and here's another chart for you while we talk. Black people... You know, uh, uh, affluent blacks who live in uh, affluent blacks live in poor neighborhoods, unlike whites. So even black people who have a they're not really affluent; they have a better income. But one of the things that I can't do, and this is something that happened with Barack Obama, we were very concerned about white fragility, fragility, right? Well, Yvette, he can't say that because white people gonna be upset. You know, he can't do that. They going they not gonna act right. They're not going to vote for him again. But he's going to come through for us in the second term. And you have a black man, not African American. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, he's not a member of my tribe. But you have this quote unquote black man who never came through for us. But y'all told me he would. So just understand that that process of, of like catering to white fragility or white racism does not work. You have to be out front in demanding and you have to own your citizenship i don't care how you feel i'm a citizen of this country i have been oppressed for hundreds of years and i have demands now if you can't meet them as a black person or black politician or black elected official let me go find a white person who can i don't care how it gets implemented i don't care who you are i'm not saying that symbolism doesn't matter i'm saying that the the, the extent to which symbolism matter has been greatly exaggerated that's what I'm saying. So as we come, as we come to a close of my segment here, I want to say that, and I've said this before, but I want to say it again. As a native black descendant of slaves, you have to understand that your primary job as a citizen is to be a primary agitator in this country. Because that's what we need. We cannot move forward if you feel that your only job is to conform. And this is sort of existential, but I'm going to say it anyway. You probably have on this planet 100 years or less. I think we need to start asking ourselves, what does your life mean? Or what do you intend for your life to mean? Your life has to be more than having a Mercedes or a Bentley at a nice house. Your life has to mean more than just having critter comforts or creature comforts that make you feel, make your body feel comfortable. You have to thoroughly engage in not only the rights for yourself and benefits for yourself, but for the people who come after you. I don't have kids, but I'm here fighting. I feel like what I do in terms of political education is fighting for native black descendants of slave kids who come after me. How are you a parent and you're not fighting for that? I don't understand. You have to engage in it. Your life has to mean something. Because I'm going to tell you something. Some of y'all call yourself Christians. Let's just be real. And you better hope if you think of that, then I'm not at the pearly gates before you are. Because I'm going to be there just dancing. And when you get there, I'm going to say, hold on one minute, JC. What's going on? Let me see that. Let me see that. I want to see that right now. I think this person commented on my page in the summer of 2015. Don't get froggy. Just hold on. Let me check the paperwork. Okay, y'all don't think you, I think you took a wrong turn. Because you're not, you're not fighting for anything other than yourself. You just want to be comfortable. I don't see how you being comfortable is a solution for the community as a whole. You have adopted this rugged individualism stuff that only works for people who have capital. And social capital, too, which basically means people who are white. It don't work for you. We have everything that we have in our community has been because of we have done it collectively. 
There is no solution for us that is not a collective solution. And I don't know what to say other than that. You are only as smart, really, as the question that you ask. And you have to have, in terms of my other solution, you have to have, like, when a politician says something to you, before that politician offers you an answer, you have to have a political expectation of what the answer should be. You cannot be there and say, well, that sounds about right. That sounds fair. I think, oh, that sounds fair to you. Sounds fair to me. Sounds fair to me. No, you have to have an expectation of what that politician should say based on your own assessment. Because if you saying that something sounds right, they always going to make it sound silky, sweet, and smooth. A politician ain't nothing but a pimp. So they always going to make it sound, see what, well, baby, you know we are here together. You got to go on that corner. We just got to do what we got to do. They going to always make it sound silky smooth. That's not the point. You have to have your thing ready. Wait a minute. I need it. I had a solution that has this, this, and this. Your solution is missing about five points. Okay? I've been in this community a long time. I know what this community needs, and you have to have that set up. You can't be waiting on a politician for a solution. You got to have your solution. You got to be. You got to be moving that politician towards a solution that you have already set up. And in terms of, in terms of, I, I began this with segregation and integration. Here's what I want to say. This, this whole thing, how we started. You have to understand, there are people who are integrate say, oh, integration didn't do nothing for us. There are people who are saying, like, you know, uh, segregation was awful. Understand how I come down, the best way I can come down. Segregation, I believe in black institutions. I graduated from historically black college. I believe, I believe the black church has a very significant role. I know some people are going to be very upset. I understand. I'm not calling I'm not calling nobody names, but I think the church as an institution is very fundamental. That doesn't mean I'm opposed to black atheists or whoever. I'm not. But I'm telling you, I believe that black business has a role as long as it's not adopted to this whole idea of rugged individualism where they don't feel like they have any, as long as they don't become Oprah. And, and feel like, be like Oprah, who feels like she can, she can talk bad about Black Lives Matter, but then donate a bunch of money to the little, the, the, the white kids at Parson. I support the kids at Parson in their protests or whatever, but Oprah, you ain't did, what'd you do for us? As long as there's some sense of collectivism, because the person who bailed Martin Luther King out of jail was a black millionaire. I understand. I support it. But what I'm telling you is that this thing, segregation versus integration, I believe in black institutions. I believe in maintaining black institutions. Because I don't believe you have a community without black institutions. But here's what I also believe. As descendants of slaves, and I'm not going to say enslaved people because they made us slaves. They made, as descendants, and I'm not going to make it sound no better than what it was. As descendants of slaves, here's what I also believe. I believe that I, you, everybody watching this show has a right to live wherever we want to live. And I believe that the Fair Housing Act hasn't done that. Well, Yvette, you just trying to say we should live around white people. I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to say that if you want to live near your job and the community near your job is white, you should have, as a descendant of slaves, the opportunity and the money to live there. Not only that, you should be free from harassment in that community. The police should not stop you like a broke watch if you're living in a white community. We have a right to this country, and that means every foot and square inch of this country. And the right to be in this country really means the right to pay for what you have to pay to live in this country. And we don't have that. We don't have the right. Well, if I live in the white neighborhood, that would be that would be three thousand dollars a month for rent. We should have that easy, but we don't. So this is not to me. This is not to me about we got to get rid of that stuff about well, you just want to live around white people. No, this is about my right to live wherever I want to live, unharassed, unbothered, because I'm as American as anybody else, more American than a lot of people. That is my right. 
So I think people, I think a lot of people have gotten a lot of stuff wrong. Yes, I want to see black institutions thrive. Yes, I want to continue to see HBCUs. Yes, I want to see black churches that are not in this prosperity preaching garbage who are just doing the work. Yes, I want to see all of that. But I also think that we have a right as Americans to be whatever we want to be. Whenever we want to be there. And we should have the wealth to make that possible and the stability to make that possible. This is not an either or type thing. I don't know how people, I, I, I just don't get it. You know, we have a right to have, we have a, people say, well, integration didn't work. Did we ever really try it? No, we didn't. Like when we integrated school, that lasted for so long, but we never integrated teachers. The teachers, you look into the, you listen to the Gladwell podcast. We never fully integrated teachers into the schools. We just, we just brought a bunch of, bunch of black kids to white schools. We need black teachers too. And not just for black kids. We show that black kids do better in, 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 you know, when, when they have a, especially black male kids, when they have a black teacher. But listen, white people need to learn how to take direction from black people. If we're going to talk about equality, you need to learn how to, you, if you have a black teacher as a white person, you learn how to be told what to do from a black person at a very early age. So you don't get prickly if you have to have a black manager. I think that's necessary. You can't look at me crazy and be all kinds of, oh, I, can't, I think you talked to me wrong. You gotta, what? If you have a black teacher who, who, who gets you in check early on, we might not have that problem. I'm just saying. So, I mean, that is the, 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 the basis of what I have to say. I'm very interested in hearing what everybody else has to say when we take the calls. I'm about to go to the calls. And um, we're going to find out what everybody got to say about everything from housing to integration uh, to everything else. So, I'm going to go to the calls. Give me a couple minutes, and then we'll be back.
Lincoln Brown family. Let me get this echo out of the way. I'm about to go to the phones. I want to hear what you all have to say. Um, it looks like it looks like I am going to 219. 219. What's your name and where you're calling from? Hi, Dad. What's this going on? Mitchie. I am in Chicago. You who? Okay, I want to. I'm in Chicago. Oh, okay. On the south side, I'm over by University of Chicago Hospital, the initial area mm -hmm. where Obama was trying to get the library and they kicked it out of there. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to talk about because I was looking in the chat and people were talking about moving into desirable neighborhoods. And what we don't really realize, although we don't own a lot in the places and the areas in which we live, we have to understand that we live on valuable property that we were pushed into, and now times are changing, and there's a realization that they want us to move. So they try to price us out. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with a lot of these major companies like the University of Chicago or the city of Chicago, they're giving incentives to the people who work in these places, tax breaks for them to live where they work. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to um, share with you guys, um, last year, Mother's Day, 2017, okay. my brother, one of my younger brothers was murdered mm -hmm. on the corner um, a couple of blocks down from my mother's house, he went to visit, and he got caught up in um, some guys who were shooting. However, that that area is under, it's, it's being gentrified, I believe the word is. Uh-huh, gentrified. And only a, block, only a few thousand or a few hundred feet down from where my brother lost his life. There are white people down there who work for the University of Chicago hospitals who are living in that area who are sitting on the corner of a cafe they just built drinking mm. coffee. Mm. And yeah. the, reason, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I am saying that these people are moving back into that area that has for so many years been unsafe for us that it is now safe for them to live where they want to live because that entire area was infested with crime and now the areas in which they are now deciding to move in, which is only a block or two over, a block down or a few feet over, the crime is being pushed away from them. Yeah. So when people say desirable areas, there are no such thing as, there's no such thing for black people, especially in Chicago, because Chicago is in a class by itself when it comes to corruption and politics and true. things like that. Very true. There's no such thing as moving to a desirable area. It's now they're moving us out of the desirable area. Because it's always been a food desert, and it's been announced just recently now, that they're going to build a new jewel there, and all that kind of thing. So people need to say, yeah, we're renters. I come from a family of renters. Yeah. There's never been an idea in my family, as far as my mother, she's the only one who's over saw us. She's never had that push that own a home idea inside of us. So my 23-year-old son, he's going to be the first person in our entire family to own a home. He's looking for a home now. Let me ask you, let me ask you a question, but, though. Let me ask you a question, though. You in Chicago, who did you vote for for mayor the last time? I'm sorry? Who did you vote for for mayor the last time? I did not vote for Emmanuel. Well, who did, did you vote for? Who did you vote Emmanuel. for, though? The last time, I'm sorry? I said, who did you vote for, though? Um, I don't know. I can't remember at this point um, who was in the line with them, but I voted for, it wasn't a big name. It was like an underdog. 
who okay. was in the race, who okay. ultimately, ultimately, ultimately lost. I can't think of who it is. I didn't even vote for our older man who's over there, whose name is Willie Cochran. What is happening is, is that the older people, or the more senior people in that area, they are now the only ones profoundly who's voting because we got a lot of people, especially young people, because a lot of people think Chicago is this big place. And you, when you see it on the news, you think it's this huge place. But if you pay attention, most of the crime that you see coming out of Chicago, it's coming out of the same area. Mm. It's the same area. They'll make Inglewood the entire city. And Inglewood doesn't stretch that far. Okay. Well, thank you, Carla. I appreciate. Area, I appreciate. You see, I appreciate sorry, you calling. In. No, I appreciate you calling in. I'm gonna try to get to some more calls and try to get some more. But I appreciate okay. you calling in, Carla. All right. I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> everybody like she ain't vote. No, whatever. I'm going to Chicago. You needed to vote because it was a lot of stuff going on in Chicago. The police, the closing of schools, a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm going to 661-661. What is your name and where you calling from? Hi, Yvette. What's going on? This is Beverly from, from Los Angeles. Okay. Well, I wanted to call in concerning um, the uh, moving from black neighborhoods to white neighborhoods. The problem we have there is that we have no representation. Mm in the black neighborhoods. The white neighborhoods have representation. Um, I want to talk also about, I came up during segregation. I was, spent 50 years of working. I too have no children, but tried to make things easier for the ones that came up behind us. Yes, integration of schools played a part but not only did the students play a part, but the teachers did too. Yeah. But when you're steadily governed by the white prejudiceness, you get tired. You can't find an ally in your brothers and sisters. They're too busy trying to keep a roof over their heads. Okay. Keep money for the kids in college which I understand. That's why some of us chose not to have children and to fight the battle. Yep. But we come across all kind of difficulties day by day, True. in and out. So many of us have gone to get higher education. And um, someone quoted the other day that they know PhDs, people with PhDs, who are driving taxis. And that's basically what I would do. To say. I appreciate you calling. Thank you for calling in. Yeah, every time, like I tell people, like it's a catch twenty two, right? If you if you decide to take Lyft or Uber, because you on one hand you'll have people say I don't take Lyft or Uber, it put taxes out of business, and I agree. But on the other hand, like the people who are driving these cars are like my people, right? Every time I get in, every time I call a, a that money native black person to send them places, we use that. So like. I'm, that's what capital does, though. Put you in a catch-22. Well, like, yeah, you want to boycott, but, like, guess who hurt? Guess who gets hurt? The thing that should have happened is that the Obama administration should have been like, no, this is not subcontracting. This is not some kind of, this is not some kind of a uh, 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 gig economy. You people are employers, and you have to treat these people like employees, and you have to give them health insurance. And you have to pay them. That's something that the Obama, the Obama administration should have done. Right? So now we're here celebrating this dude who didn't, who didn't do what was necessary for our people to have a livelihood. That's what we're here doing. That's why I don't celebrate him. Because if he had put, if he had, like, you don't, people don't understand how much labor law, labor law was here, is What's left of it is here to protect us. People don't understand how much labor law was shredded to make a way for Uber and Lyft. But while your president, your first black president was in office, it's no surprise. Look at how many people 
who left the Obama administration to go work for Uber. That's no, that's no mistake. They cashed out. And they cashed out because of the stuff that they did while they were in office to pave a way for these people. You think David Pluff and all those people really care about what happens to black people? No. Don't care about me. Don't care about you. Obama don't care about you either. So anyway, I'm going to the next call. 412. 412, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? Uh, hey, what's going on? Thanks, thanks. This is uh, What's your name, bro? Bruce. Okay. Bruce Jones, Pittsburgh. What's up, Bruce? Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I listen to your show. I'm a subscriber and, and a donator. I appreciate all the things you do. And, uh, and I'm listening to you tonight. And that, that's what I like to talk about is, uh, you know, the credit, how, you know, we need to get our credit together. I mean, it's important. You know, without credit, you can't do nothing out here. If you have $200,000 to drop on a home or something like that, you must have your credit, right? And I do not advocate that towards our young people, but there are so many traps out there to destroy your credit with these cell phones and different other things, you know, to get easy. When you got to make that payment, you know, then it becomes hard. So, you know, that's one thing that we need to start teaching our young people about keeping your credit up and keeping that credit score up. You know, and that's what I advocate for. And also, I like to talk about, you know, the color of law. That's a very important book that gives us our history. It shows us how government really wiped us out, you know, as far as they kept us out of, uh, you know, the uh, the process of buying homes and building up equity and stuff like that, you know. And, and I'm glad you uh, advocate these books for us to learn, you know, that what happened to us as a people. What we can understand where we came from and how we got in the situation that we're in, but you're also giving us solutions. And the solution you always preach is government. And I appreciate that because I had an argument yesterday with a guy. He's about government. He hates the government, 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 government. But without the government, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. I mean, being a veteran, you know, the government has really, like, helped me to buy two homes. I work for the government. Without the government, I would have nothing. So, you know, I... I to make that point that we can okay. say the government is the government that but the government is the problem and the government is also the solution. I truly believe in that because I have friends who are contractors and had their own small business and I tell them, go after the government contract. Get this local government here in Pittsburgh so much gentrification in the east is of Pittsburgh and as the call of your was talking about, you see the white folks walking around the black neighborhood now, all the black people get pushed out. You know, out to the eastern suburbs. So, you know, it's a struggle. That's their struggle. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. And hopefully, um, it we can is teach what it is. Of- I thank you, Carla. I appreciate it. I'm going to have to let you go, but I appreciate you calling in. Thank you, Carla. The only thing I would say about credit is this credit is the outcome. See, part of what we do as black people. Is, is is like we have gotten too into focusing on outcomes, right? And so we say, you can get this if you have good credit. You should have good credit. You should focus on your credit. And the problem is we don't understand that credit is an outcome of stability. So what we should be saying is that you have to make us stable. We need to be stable in order to get this credit, right? Because it's something that like, you know, you, 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 it's like you're going through this landmine. Oh, and then you see people around you get blown to bits. We, we can't focus on like the outcome as like the thing to do. The thing that we need to focus on is the thing that leads to the outcome. That's the important thing. This thing that leads to the outcome is most important, not the outcome itself. And the thing that leads to good credit is stability. And so the question you have to ask yourself is why are there so many people in our community who are unstable? And if you ask that, and if you look at history, you can go all the way from slavery to Reconstruction to, 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 to now, to the Reagan, to Clinton. And it's, it's clear, right? So you don't put, like, you have to be very careful. Like, please understand me. We have to start being very careful about shifting responsibility. Because what you have a lot of do-for-selfers do is try to shift responsibility and blame from the government and blame from white capital to, like, descendants of slaves native blacks do not shift blame you cannot shift blame 
from them to me. I had no agency in this. I had no control over this. This is them. Them, me, them, me, them, me. So when you when you assess these things, I want you to be very careful, people, in terms of how you begin to assess blame. Um, so I'm going right now to um, 908. 908, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, Yvette. How are we doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Good, good. Wow, this is my first call, and I actually got on line. <laughs> I'm not going to be too quick because I hate the callers that take all day. I know they do. <laughs> they, they be talking. Yeah. But um, I, I'm not even going to be on here preaching. I just want to ask a question real quick. Sure, go ahead. I want to greet you and, and appreciate, tell you I appreciate all the work Thank that you. you and Tone do. I'm always watching Tone talks as well. But mm -hmm. um, and my favorite caller is Alexander. Just had to throw that out there real quick. Ah, everybody's um, favorite. That got it's Antonio and Alexander. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got and I got my color of law. Just got my color of law in the other day. Just wanted to throw that out there. Appreciate you. Yeah, read that. That, 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 that thing is good. Read that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for, for all the people in the chat and all of that, I just wanted to throw one thing that, that that Yvette said tonight. One little quote. She said, "You're only as smart as the question you ask." Mm. I want anybody to, 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 just, just to take that with you tonight, man, if y'all don't take that notes, man. But I want to throw one question slash suggestion out there. I want to know what you think about it, little food for thought real quick, and then I'll get off your line, all right? Sure. Now, with, with, the, uh, with our connotation that you want, you know what I mean, we call ourselves native black descendants of slaves, mm -hmm. I'm 100% I'm with that. And I understand that you've been saying that we need to be very specific with our claim. You yeah. understand? So what I wanted to add on to that and see what, what the people would think, what about native black descendants of chattel slaves? Oh. And I, and I want to uh, tell you why. Okay. Because when, I don't know about anybody else, but when I speak about, you know, these particular issues of, of race and lineage and every with, with the people around me, and I, I throw the word slavery out there, people of other groups like to attach themselves mm. to the word slavery. Mm. Oh, we were slaves too, and, 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 and my people went through slavery too, and all of this kind of stuff, right? So I'm like, well... You didn't go through chattel slavery. Yeah, that's true. You went through a dentist service. It's like you got to break it all down and all that kind of stuff. So I, I feel like, what do you feel about being a little bit more specific in saying descendants of chattel slaves? I, I, and, I, and actually, I actually, actually don't have, don't have a, I actually don't have a problem with that. I actually don't have a problem with that, caller. Because one of the things that you find is Irish people keep coming to talk about their slaves. And that's like a myth. And so I do think if you said yeah. chattel slaves, that you kind of, you kind of like, who was in chains, bruh? Like, you know, and, and, and you make exactly. it, so I don't really have a problem with it. You know, the, 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 how, how we have to differentiate ourselves is very important. So if you want to add chattel slaves to that, I would, I would not have a, I would not have a problem with it because people be stealing. Yeah, and, and they always trying to, to attach themselves. Every time I say something like that, they're like, oh, yeah, well, my people with slavery it don't matter where they from. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, 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 you know what I mean? You haven't went through chattel slavery, so how can you attach yourselves to what I've been through? I have a specific claim here. You yep. know, I'll be throwing the, the, the event called Nell at him real quick. Uh -huh. now, you to come with, you're trying to attach to me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I just wanted to throw that out there to you and the people, man. Appreciate you, uh, you and, and Tone you. and everything y'all do, you. man. Keep moving, all right? And no, I'm, I appreciate you, bro. For, um, your, your maintenance to be done on your breakingbrown.com so I can um, get on there, too, as well. Yeah, I'm having that um, that, that, that site redone a bit um, to, 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 do, to do some other stuff with it. I said I was going to do. Um, so I hopefully will have it back yeah, up yeah. by the we, end of this we week. Patient, though. We patient. Yeah, so I'm gonna have it back up and get it back up. Yeah, so so uh, so I so I appreciate you though, bro. Yeah, yeah, everybody. I don't I don't I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I think you have to do whatever you have to do differenti to differentiate yourself from these people who try to steal your claim. So if that means adding another word to the definition, because chattel slave is chattel slavery. Because people are trying, but we were slaves too. We couldn't go nowhere. Were you in chains? 
And did it, I mean, chattel slavery is, a, look it up, chattel slavery is different. In terms of, and no other, no other community, people, somebody came up and said, what about the Chinese people who built the railroads? Understanding no other community has dealt with what we dealt with in terms of consistent, not only degradation, subjugation, oppression, over generations, sustained, and that's why we're here right now. So, I'm going to go to my next caller, 202, I think I recognize this number, 202, I'm coming to you, what's your name, where you calling from? What is going on? Oh, <laughs> I knew I recognized that number, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it is uh, as usual. Uh, you are dropping the knowledge. All right, so have you ever looked at a border patrol video? I have. If you look at them border patrol videos, what always stands out to me is the fact that the people in the uniforms with the guns and the nightsticks guarding the border of the United States look just like the people they keep it out. <laughs> now I want you to think about that for a minute. <laughs> so here you got some people who are obviously of Mexican descent. Mm. And they are being hired to keep out people that look like them mm -hmm. they speak the same language you know some of them actually they did a story on uh, one of them in new york Times. they actually came from the same family um, really they the came from the same rules. family yeah some wow. of them come from the, the some of them have actually came from the same neighborhood keep in mind the immigration rules 30 years ago Mm. are much different than they are now. Very much so. So the person that was able to come over from Mexico 30 years ago, you know, with a child and keep their child here and raise them in America and get all the privileges, they grow up to get a job working for the government to keep their people out. Mm. Now th think about the psychology mm. of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you understand that, if you can truly understand that, then you can understand our plight as black Americans. Mm. Don't we have certain people who are standing at the gates and the borders of opportunity that are keeping us out? Uh -oh. I mean, I read an article uh -oh. recently about Ben Carson. Ben Carson is over HUD now. Yeah. And can you believe, with all the history, the most sued agency uh, in yeah. all of the government, he actually is trying to delete the, the phrase yeah. free from di di discrimination yeah. from the HUD mission statement. Yeah. He's trying to delete it. For, and, and he's trying to shut down the enforcement provision event, the enforcement provision office of HUD to stop it from you know, going after some of these federal housing discrimination issues. Or what about our, uh, uh, the woman with melanin in her skin who is being forced to step down from the New York uh, uh, Housing Department in, in New York uh, and the scandal that she's going through with uh, allowing some of the rules to be skirted as it relates to the lead paint and asbestos in oh, the housing wow. projects in New York. Yeah. Or what about Atlanta? Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. The housing projects, the housing projects were eradicated all up yep. under black mayors. Black mayors. Uh, 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 Black mayors and black city councils, and you had, you know, communities like Grant Park, which used to be African American when you and I were coming up, Yvette. They're now white because during the Andy Young and Maynard Jackson, and to a lesser degree, Bill Campbell years, those properties, because black people were not able to pass those on to uh, 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 family members who were mm. doing well due to the... The, um, uh, the actual war on drugs that was uh, decimating black families, so whole generations of black families could not take over as next generations uh, uh, of wealth, and as a result, the city condemned that property.
property mm. and white people were able to step in and buy it for pennies on the dollar and now you can't get in over there for less than a million dollars well that's all up under black leadership yeah. so just like yeah. you see those hispanic people uh, border Patrol agents, you know, stopping their brethren from coming in America. We, too, have brethren who are stopping us from getting ahead. I think even, I think we need to make the tribe even smaller. <laughs> you, say, you say we need to do it, uh, call it descendants of slaves. I think we should do them one better. We need to call them descendants of free slaves. And I think, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many free slaves we actually have today. Uh, I'm less interested in forming a tribe around people who are still enslaved. And I'm more interested in forming a tribe with people who uh, are actually thinking toward our true emancipation. Now, oh the only other thing I want to say on this is that we have to, in order to, to really get beyond these issues that you are talking about, uh -huh. we're going to have to realize that we're going to have to find a bond with imperfect allies. Mm, that yeah, is very important. I, 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 don't, I don't think Yvette is suggesting that only people, you know, who are descendants of slaves can help us. No, Consider these that. words. My paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do it. What do I do about slavery and the colored race? I do it because it saves the Union, not on behalf of the welfare of the slave. That's Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. That's Abraham Lincoln in the Emancipation Proclamation. The only reason why I highlight that, because I think the biggest solution to what we are dealing with, well, if you want to call it a solution, I'm a fatalist, of course, but if we're going to go after something, we need to go after the imperfect ally. I say it all the time. My friend says, if you can find a rich white man, old white man trying to get into heaven, you will find paradise. Because there are a lot of people who recognize the poverty, the discrimination, which you're talking about in housing, that is killing black people, and they are actually looking to partner. I would yeah. rather partner with them than a person who thinks they can drive a Bentley or a Rolls Royce to heaven. Because mm. their heaven will not mean anything for me. I've been looking for one, Alexander. You know, I'm looking for an old white person trying to get into heaven. I got, a, I got some for him. I got some for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's an awesome thing. And I've found that there are a few people who actually see these issues. And event, believe it or not, I've talked to some white folks who actually watched your show. Mm. Which which kind of shocked me, but, you know, they, and, and they actually weren't on, turned off by it. <laughs> I, I, I've talked to a few myself. <laughs> All right, good people. I'll let you guys go. It's usually, it's always a good show. Appreciate you, bro. I, I, that y'all know who that is. I ain't even got to say it. That's Mr. Sure. Alexander. He always coming up in here, dropping the knowledge on everybody, like bombs, like pow, pow, pow. Um, yeah, like I like I've always said this. I will partner with I, I want a black agenda. That black agenda does not necessarily need to be executed by black people. So do not think because you are a black person or because you are in the Congressional Black Caucus that I would necessarily have to seek you out and seek out your favor to execute my agenda. I don't care who executes my agenda. I just need the agenda executed. And if I find some old guilty white person who wants to get into heaven and is willing to do that, then I'm all for it. Because I'm just about I'm just about how do my people first survive and then thrive. I don't care about I don't care about the rest of that stuff. Elsie Hastings. Anyway, I'm going to um, area code nine one seven nine one seven. I'm coming to you now. What's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, Matt. This is Stacy from North Carolina. How What's going on, Stacy? Um, I'm just calling because you're on fire as usual. Thank you. 
Um, I've it. been a landlord for 24 years. Okay. And I'm from New York. So I started out in New York, and now I'm in North Carolina. Okay. And, you know, it tickles me because these um, do for selfers, I couldn't have done for self to get my first house in um, New York, and I lived in Brooklyn. And what helped me was ACORN. Mm. That organization helped me get my first mortgage. And I, when I sit back and think about it, I don't think that I would have had the resources because I tried to go out there and get a mortgage, a conventional mortgage. And I was coming across shisty, shistier and shistiest mm. type of mortgage brokers. And so Acorn kind of fell into my radar and I went to them and they walked me through the process. Okay. And now Acorn is not even around anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they really helped me. And then where I lived, I lived in Park Slope, Brooklyn, which is a million dollar area now. I couldn't afford to buy the house. When I sold it, you know, it was amazing to me because I couldn't afford to buy that same house. If I had to go buy that same house, mm. I was priced out. And now I'm in North Carolina in Winston. And I, I bought, I have two houses here. So one I have a mortgage on and I had to deal with Wells Fargo. And the interesting thing was, Wells Fargo tried to throw every, when I tell you, every block they could in front of me, mm -hmm. they tried it. And the only, I would say, my saving grace was that I did have an ally. Mm. I had an ally because I bought from a, a builder. Okay. And, um... There was a salesperson there, a white man, um, and he kind of facilitated because Wells Fargo was just acting crazy. One of the reasons they tried to deny me was to say, well, because um, I was buying a, a rental property. And they were like, well, you don't have history as a, a property manager. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I've done it for, eight, it was 18 years at the time. Okay. So they were just coming up with stupid yeah, stuff. stuff. And so when I look at where we are in, you know, trying to navigate the system, like I said, if I didn't have Acorn behind me, if I didn't have certain allies behind me, I don't know if I would be in the position that I'm in now okay. yeah Let's and see. so when they talk about doing for yourself no one does for self everyone needs a hand big corporations take you know help from the government all, all the time. time all the time and i'm a, a a black woman coming from the projects of new york who didn't have home ownership in her history my mom didn't own a home when I first went out there to become a landlord, because I kind of did, did things differently, I didn't just buy a single-family house. I bought a multi-family dwelling. So all my friends were buying the single family, and I was mm -hmm. like, well, if I lose my job, I'm screwed. Yeah. So at least with a multi-family dwelling, what you could do in New York, it's not typical in places like North Carolina, but, um, mm. you know, I could do that. But, okay. again, I couldn't have done that unless I had help. And so now I couldn't even, I don't even think I could go back into New York because I'm so priced out. No, you could. You ain't got to think about it. You the can't. Resources, and the resources are not there anymore. So it doesn't matter if you have good credit. It doesn't matter if you have a down payment. I mean, these people are throwing cash around. You got a million dollars in cash sitting around someplace? Who? Who are you talking to? I'm just saying to people who don't want to do for something. You know, sick. Listen. Do they got a million dollars sitting around in cash to buy a house? You know they ain't. You know they lying. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I just wanted to share that story with you because I just think it's hysterical. Ain't nobody out here doing for something. 
No, ain't nobody out here. It's a lot of people. Out, it's a lot of people out here lying, though. It's a lot. It's a lot of liars. Thank you, Carla. I appreciate you. I'm gonna get to two more calls um before we drop tonight. Two more calls, but yeah, ain't nobody got no because that's what it takes. It's like the caller last week. I mean, no Monday who was uh trolling and like you just gotta do for self. No, you have to have a significant amount of money to maneuver. So if you're gonna send a kid and you're gonna tell that kid he gonna go to Stanford. And you're going to live a decent life. you got to have at least half a million in the bank. And I'm not talking about half a million worth. I'm talking about half a million liquid. Right? And if you don't have that, then you just don't have what it takes to send a kid to Stanford or Harvard. So what does that mean for you? It means you got to get real with yourself about who you are and what you have and what you can give your kids. A lot of us didn't have kids because the math didn't make no sense. And a lot of us... I'm not going, I'm not trying to say nothing, but a lot of you who did have kids are like, well, you got to help me because I didn't do the math, but I got all these babies. Like, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that I, I won't help you somewhat, but we got to start doing math and being like, listen, me, I should be able to have kids and have a family in the country that I built with free labor. My ancestors built this. We've been oppressed. And so I have to be involved in a political avenue. So that I can have this family and I'm not shut out from what it means to be American. That's part of the work that we have to do. And we're letting these people run around telling us, like, you need real money in America. You're not going to be able to flip $2,000 or $3,000. Now, understand, middle black family has less. It used to be $1,700. Now it's probably about $1,400 once you take out depreciable assets. You can't flip. What you going to do with $1,400? Not, not a goddamn thing understand that so two more calls i'm going to um i am going to 404 first 404 what's your name where you calling from hi hi this is renee i'm calling from atlanta hey renee how are you pretty good how about you i'm good i want to say thank you thank you to you and antonio i have thank been you. following politics since i was yeah, and, yeah. and y'all have like broken this, broken the policy and a lot of the things that are happening to us in ways that a lot of people are not. And so I appreciate y'all for Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make two points. Okay. So I live here in Atlanta and something that I learned last year was that a lot of these companies are forming and what they're doing is they are buying houses literally their warehousing properties and they are buying them literally pennies on a dollar and essentially creating monopolies mm -hmm. where let's say even if we had the money to buy property we're basically priced out because we don't have the capital nor do we have the backing of the banks to buy houses in bulk mm. there you go so like how, how do you compete with it you don't you can't um, and, and I actually met a black woman who actually helps uh, these, these companies get houses through warehousing. And in the state of Georgia, it is not illegal. And you do have some realtors that I met who are very conscious of, like, keeping communities more communal. Uh -huh. And they are trying to work to get some laws created to circumvent that. But in the meantime, houses are being sold in the state of Georgia literally to these companies for pennies on the dollar and we could never get that kind of break no but that's but that's everywhere like i was reading an article i was reading an article thank you Carla. i appreciate you calling in but i was i was reading an article and there was this guy who it was some local article where there was a land deal and the land that was supposed to be five million he got 25 million for this white lawmaker and it's like this little local news article because it's not a big deal. This is how they move. And see, the thing we don't understand about politics, we say, well, I don't need politics. I'm going to do business. We don't understand that politics is what allows these business people to move like that, to make that kind of money and amass that kind of wealth, right? That's how they're moving now. Through local government, through federal government, that's how they're moving. And you don't even know enough as a person to know that, like, that's what, like, undergirds the whole thing. You have people, you have companies who are, undergirded by subsidies period and like 
as a black business owner, you don't know enough to know that? You don't pay attention enough to know that? How can I follow you? I can't. I just got to leave you alone. So I'm going to 773. Um, 773, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, Beth, this is John from Cicero, Chicago, Illinois. What's going on? You. Hey, Beth, thanks for educating me. We need it terribly. You know, I was listening to uh, the news this morning. Chicago, 31% black. Uh huh. I grew up in Chicago when it was, uh, 52, 55, 60% black. Okay. Uh, tried to buy a home, was in the process of buying a home, black real estate company, had the loan, had the approval, everything was done. Okay. Then on the west side of Chicago, where I grew up at. Okay. $275,000 oh for a house that the developer bought for $15,000. Ain't that something? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what I would say to people is you have to know that I, I don't care how much you pay for it. On the west side of Chicago, the house is just simply not going to accrue the equity. No, never. So you have to be willing to let go, you know, and, and fight another battle. So you, you said something very important. At some point, you got to stand and fight. And what I love about what you say is, you know, it's real easy, man, to, to uh, think that you can do for self as opposed to fighting the biggest dog in the yard. Yep. The federal government. Yep, you got to go at him, though. Yep. The local government. Because you're absolutely right. You know, I'm 55 years old, and, and I've seen a lot. I, 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 I lived right around the corner from where Richard J. Daly said, shoot the kill if they cross Pulaski, protecting mm. a gold black uh, store. Yeah, I, I just saw the whole thing go down, and I saw that I saw this community stay the same for years. And all of a sudden, we are just being pushed out of it, and we need to go after the people that caused the situation. And I'd just like to say one other thing. Sure. It's so hard, like Harriet Tubman said, she could have uh, freed a whole lot more slaves if they had just knew that they were slaves. We were around a whole lot of slaves. I talk to people. Yeah, I, I, I talk to people, and I tell them, hey, the color of law. Hey, the half have not been told. And these are books at 55 that yeah. I heard you, Tony, Absolutely. You guys mentioned, we have to keep an open mind. I don't know everything. I'm not going to about to sit here and act like I got it. Because I don't. I have a whole lot of credit. The credit ain't nothing but access. Yeah, I can put my hands on $80,000 worth of credit, but it ain't nothing but debt. Mm. So why would I? You, 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 you have to learn how to use it appropriately. I'm proud that I was able to give my daughter that's in college a 1997 Toyota Camry. Mm -hmm. And she honored that Toyota Camry. And she finally got to a place where she could buy her another car. Guess what she did? She gave it to her little brother. So that he, yeah, we, we have to do the little small things. Mm -hmm. And I always give to my children, hey, I always email them. Is that Carmel Tone Talk? Because... They, they're young enough. They're 29, 21. Do the politics now. Because, yes. like you said, it, 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 what, what use is it a 68 year old man who, like you told that guy talking about, go out there and give him a. Man, go to sleep. <laughs> you ain't gonna fight nothing. You can't, eat, you can't fight nothing. Yeah, you gotta go to bed. Let that go. Just pass that your bedtime. But not, not only that, Carla, this is a person. Up to what they did. Yeah, but not only not only that, Carla. Like what you have with somebody with some older callers is that they want to tell tell people like me, I'm a Gen Xer, and then the millennials to fight, right? But you didn't fight. Right. You didn't fight. You didn't, you led a good right. life, and you want to tell me to fight. What's wrong with you? If, if that may I say one other thing? Sure. What what and uh, and. Uh, uh, Close to Oklahoma, the government allowed white mobs to come in and 
basically burned down what is termed today as Black Wall Street, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, 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 I remember the Bulls winning the championship in 1992, 1994, 96. Y'all could tie the West Side up, but you mm. did not go one block past Austin, Austin okay. or Roosevelt or any place where white people live because the government protected where they were. Mm. You get it? There you go. Love you, my dear. Thank you, brother. Love I appreciate you. you. Have a great night. You too. I'm going to take one last right. caller. We about two hours. One last caller. Um, I'm going to 253. 253, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, Randy Sounds from Seattle. What's going on? Hey, so I got five points, actually. Um, five? Uh, you got five, uh, brother? You better get through that quick. Five? I'll be, I'll be quick, though. I'll be quick, though. I promise. Good. I promise. So um, the guy before Alexander was talking about how um, other people uh, basically talked about slavery and people talked about the Irish slavery stuff. One, of, one rebuttal that I use with white people that say that is basically say that um, you ask them if they were able to keep their name or if they were able to keep their religion. Because, you know, we weren't, you know, and uh, I think that's important. And that, that would usually stop them from I mean, talking about that at that point. So that's the first point. Okay. Second point, um, price of land. Um, so I was doing research because I was thinking about, you know, one, you know, price of living is getting high for everyone. And honestly, you guys mentioned it earlier, as far as, you know, being African-American, the descendants of the slaves, we're not able to live here anymore. It's getting too expensive. Uh -huh. um, and I'm finding that even, you know, if we were to try to get a trailer and get some land and try to do that, you can't even do that. And it's just, it's just harder to get by. And I foresee in the future getting, you know, a lot harder for us. And I don't think a lot of us, a lot lot of us right now. realize how much tougher it's going to get. Um, the third point, which is really important, Reverse loans, um, I'm noticing a lot of, especially like baby, baby boomers, like African American baby boomers, what they're doing is they're not giving the wealth to, you know, their family, their extended family, or their, their kids, what they're doing is that they're doing reverse mortgage. Which is mm. basically their. Yeah, that the reverse mortgage stuff, that's a problem, that's a problem. And let me tell you what, some of y'all are doing those, hold on one second, Carla, hold on. Some of y'all are doing those reverse mortgages for all the wrong reasons. I know people who are, do, I know, you know, black men who are doing reverse mortgages to get Harleys. If you don't get somewhere and sit your head down, I know black women who will get, well, I need, I need some extra money or whatever. No, you don't get to do that. Like, you have to make things better for your kids. You don't get to do a reverse mortgage and take money out because of what you need. And you're too old to need anything anyway. Go on, Carl. I'm sorry to let you finish. No, like I said, I needed you, you know, I needed that would get you thinking about it. Um, the last thing um, that I've been thinking about uh, is credit. And, you know, as far as being an African-American with a single betrayal, credit and how that kind of affects our lives, you know, they actually, uh, you know, use credit to hire us. And which I think is really strange, like, that they, you know, use credit reports to, you know, make decisions on hiring because, you know, that's definitely going to affect us, you know, trying to get work. If you guys are looking at credit reports that, you know, our credit's going to be a lot worse than, you know, the, the white person next door. So um, the other thing I was kind of curious about as far as what credit is concerned is if, if they, and of course you're not going to say this, but I'm wondering if there are special codes so that, that they know that the person that they're putting the credit report on are African American or in a post by the else, if they're able to like determine that, because it seems like, you know, a lot of African Americans have very low, well, right. uh, for the most part, credit scores, and you know, these credit scores affect so much in our lives here. Um, I don't know. I think this is something to look into. Um, Thank and you. the last point, I pause. The, the last point. Um, my dad was in the military, and apparently, being in the military, you're supposed to be able to get VA loans. My dad was never, ever able. No, to get we didn't VA get them because, because he knew they, they they never approved them for us. They never approved VA loans. Yep. They like it's like there's a statistic out that it's like one percent or less of those loans went to us. 
Like, no, they, did, they didn't go to us. Like, we haven't, we never had, we as people who built this country and our ancestors built this country, we've never had to, been able to access what it means to be American. That should enrage every, every black person. So, I mean, I appreciate you calling in, Colin. You, you, you exactly right. It should, it should enrage us. Um, I wanna, I wanna, of course, um, the chat as always has been lit. I want to thank everybody who called in tonight. I appreciate you. Um, I want to, if I didn't get to you, um, I'm sorry. Remember that there will not be a show on Monday. Rem there will be a special show on Wednesday, but remember I'm traveling, moving around. So there will not be a show on Monday. So everybody remember. And if you see people like she told y'all that there ain't going to be no show on Monday. So there's no show on Monday. There will be a show on Wednesday. There will be a hopefully a special reveal um, on Wednesday, and we're gonna we're gonna get some stuff hashed out. Breaking Brown family, as always, I appreciate you. Please like, please subscribe, please share with your friends. Please hit the button, that little ping, that little that little bell, so that um you can know when I'm online. Somebody told me there's a way you set that up a specific way, whether you always get the notification or whether you sometimes get the notification. I don't know. But um, check that out. And I appreciate everybody. Um, love y'all. And I will see y'all on Wednesday, a week from today. So is it day Wednesday? Yeah, I'll see y'all. So, and we'll have a, we're going to have a whole special conversation. I um, mean, I think Tone Talks is going to be involved in that conversation if it happens the way it's supposed to happen. All right. Um, talk soon, everybody. Love you.